I think one question to ask yourself, a good beginning litmus test question is, for how much of the day can you reach your phone without moving your feet? And about 80% of adults say that they can reach their phones without moving their feet 24 hours a day, which basically means that for all intents and purposes for function, it's basically an implant. It's a part of your body, just like your limbs, just like your head, your brain. And so if you let anything follow you around 24 hours a day, it's gonna have an outsized effect on your experience of the world. And when it's a device that's designed to be as sticky, as difficult to resist as a phone, as a smartphone, you're in a lot of trouble to begin with. Welcome to the Spartan Up podcast with Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan Race. We are talking about overcoming obstacles. The same way we teach people to get over obstacles on the course, we will teach you here on the Spartan Up podcast to get over obstacles in your mind. Today, Joe DeSena talks to Adam Alter, author of Irresistible, The Rise of Addictive Technology and the Business of Keeping Us Hooked about the outsized influence addictive technology may be having on you, and some basic steps to get it back in balance. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Athletic Brewing Company, pioneering a revolution in craft, non-alcoholic beers. Place your order today at athleticbrewing.com and get free shipping on two six-packs or more. We are here for Spartan Up Podcast. I'm with Adam Alter, the uh, author of a great book called Irresistible. And he is going to teach us how to, can you teach us how to get off our devices? I can try, I can give you some ideas. Yeah, I mean, but that, that's basically what you dug into. You, you, you looked into this uh, world of devices and you know, I assume you, get, you got on this podcast because you know I'm really passionate about getting people healthy, getting them off the couch, getting them off this fucking device. I'm addicted to it too, first thing in the morning. I go right to, I don't even know why I'm looking at it. I think I'm just trying to avoid my workout. So what would you, would you figure out? Is there some, is it a problem? Yeah, it's a problem. I, I think one question to ask yourself, a good beginning litmus test question is, for how much of the day can you reach your phone without moving your feet? And about 80% of adults say that they can reach their phones without moving their feet 24 hours a day, which basically means that for all intents and purposes for function, it's basically an implant. It's a part of your body, just like your limbs, just like your head, your brain. And so if you let anything follow you around 24 hours a day, it's gonna have an outsized effect on your experience of the world. And when it's a device that's designed to be as sticky, as difficult to resist as a phone, as a smartphone, you're in a lot of trouble to begin with. And so the first thing is really just distance yourself from the device. You just gave me an idea. You and I could start a business. We should, we should um, create like a drone phone and it always <laughs> runs away and you have to chase it everywhere. Would that work? There's a, there's a great alarm clock called a clocky, which does that. It's a little clock alarm clock on wheels. And it, as, as soon as the alarm goes off, it runs around your bedroom and you have to chase it. So it gets you out of the bed. I think we could do something similar with a phone. Put a little couple of little wheels on the, the front and back of the phone and then it rolls away when you, when you try to use it. So the thing that's driving me nuts, like COVID, right? I'm fighting with people online. They're sending me emails. Joe, you, you want to have events. You want people to die. And, and it's like, no, but there's unintended consequences to being stuck in your home. Like we already, we were already on this downward spiral of being addicted to this thing and chips and sugary drinks and a layer on top of it. Now you're in your house. By the way, my wife just walked in the kitchen. My wife and I battle over this. I have an expert on the phone. I know. I right? heard I'm you doing, chatting. I'm and doing I a podcast, right? You're going to be live. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi. Hello. All right. So, Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> the name of the book is called Irresistible. He's done an enormous amount of work figuring out that these things are terrible. And that you said yeah. our children should not have a device till they're 22. Is that what you said? I, I don't think I said that, but uh, if you want to go along with that, uh, that older an age, that's fine with me. I think most people say something like 13. So what's the problem? Like what, what it's, it's, it's addictive. It, you don't have to walk uh, to get it, right? You just go down and start typing on it. And so you're not moving all day. And then you lose all this free time we used to have. I mean, there are so many different problems with it. It's hard to know even where to begin. I think for kids in particular, when you are face to face with a real person and you interact with that person, you learn a lot about how, what it means to be a social being in the world. Like you pick up different subtle differences in facial expressions. Um, you learn the difference between anger and sadness. You, you learn, you take another kid's toy, you get bopped on the head. You, you need those experiences to learn how to live in the world. 
And when everything's mediated through a screen, everything's distant, feedback's slower, you don't actually look people in the eyes. I think there are a lot of problems that just come from being remote in that sense. But, but even beyond that, if you do something that takes up six hours a day, seven days a week, 42 hours a week, blow that up to the lifespan, we're talking about 15 or 20 years of our lives. This is, this is, I'll give you a snapshot of 20 years of my life. This is it. And think about what that means, especially for young kids, but for adults too. I mean, it's, it has this colossal effect on how much productivity we're going to have, how easy it is for us to go outside and exercise, how easy it is for us to interact with other people. It just gets in the way of absolutely everything. So a lot of what you lose is, is what you could be doing with that time otherwise. So what's the solution? What are we gonna, what are we gonna do about it? I mean, if Apple and Samsung are not willing to cook, cause what I think Apple and Samsung could do and solve this problem overnight is simply put something on the phone that recognizes if I just did some burpees or went for a run. And so I have to earn every 10 minutes of usage of this. That would change the game. That would actually turn our whole conversation around 180 degrees and turn this into something that's actually helping the world because we weren't doing the burpees before. I think you should create that app because the being sedentary, not moving around, not exercising is such a big, big consequence of having phones. If you could turn the phone into a device that motivated people to move and it, it's got all the, it's got all the things inside it. It's got the accelerometers. It, it knows where it is at all times. So if you're doing burpees, it's going to know that there's a pattern of activity that suggests you're doing burpees. So I, I think that's a great business idea. You build an app for the phone, that gates your access to the phone and determines how much access you're gonna have based on exercise. So if I run for an hour today, I get an extra half an hour on the phone or whatever it might be. I think that's, that's, that solves a very narrow part of the problem, which is that we're not moving around enough because we spend so much time sitting still with our phones. It doesn't solve all the problems, but it solves one of the big ones for well, sure. I'll one part of the app. You ready? Here's the other, here's the other part of the app. Good job, guys. <laughs> Great. I'm gonna go do some burpees and watch Cobra Kai. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, but it's important now, my wife knows when I smash all the kids' devices with a sledgehammer, um, I did, I learned, I learned from you, I learned from you, but the other part of the problem I thought is, the phone is feeding me what I want to read. It, it recognizes that I read this type of news, and so it only feeds me that, right? And it gets narrower and narrower and narrower, and so, what I want the app to also do is mandate that I have to see the other side of the arguments for 30 minutes a day, right? Yeah. So if I watch Fox News, now I have to watch MSNBC for 30 minutes. Yeah, well, so what, what these phones, what the, the app developers have, have learned is that when you feed people information from within their own echo chamber, it makes them, first of all, it makes them angrier. And anger is one of the most galvanizing emotions. It gets people to keep doing what they're doing. So if I'm looking at Facebook and I'm getting angry because my side's arguments are being displayed and I'm like, right on, that's terrible. I need to, like, we all need to coalesce and be angry about this issue. I'm going to stay on for longer. If you start feeding people information from the other side, it turns them away. They, they're either in disgust or just because they don't want to engage, they just say, all right, I'm done with this. I'm going to move on with my day. So while that's great for you and I think it's worthwhile, I think exposing people to all sides of all arguments is worthwhile. It's valuable in all sorts of different respects, it, it goes against the very reasons these companies exist. And so that's a big part of the problem. Got it. And, and um, do you think in Silicon Valley, do you think the folks that are uh, doing this analysis, I mean, basically this is food, right? You're selling food, like you just said, you want more time on the phone if you're one of those execs. Do you think they recognize that this is unhealthy, but do it anyway? Yeah, we know that. We know that because they've been interviewed and they say, they've said, a number of them, we, we are sort of agnostic about consumer well-being and consumer welfare. We don't really, we're not trying to hurt people, but also it's not our primary aim. Our primary aim is to ensure that you spend as many minutes of the day on the screen as possible. And if you do that, we'll consider it a success. So if we introduce a new feature and that gets an extra 10 minutes out of you every day, that's a success. If we introduce a feature and it makes you happier, we don't really care about that as much. As long as you're spending time on the screen, that's, that's our main motivation. And they've been quite candid about it, some of them. Others have been more cagey about it, but certainly that's, that's what they care about. Because they're getting advertising dollars based on how much time people spend on the screen. 
if you're on Facebook and you can tell people you need to advertise on our platform because people spend an average of two hours a day on Facebook, for example, um, that's going to make you a more attractive place for people to put their ad dollars when they're promoting their products than it would be if you were doing it on a platform where people only spend 10 minutes a day, for example. So that's why they care so much about that. Do we know if, if, if their ch the children of the execs are on phones or not? Like, like while my wife's still in the kitchen, you got to hear this. Sorry. Whatever the answer is, I'm rolling the dice. I don't know yeah. what he's going to say. Yeah. Um, the executives, the people in the know at these companies in Silicon Valley, are their children using devices or not? There's a great article in the New York Times about six years ago that explored that question. And they basically found that a lot of the Silicon Valley tech execs don't let their kids near phones or near their products. So the classic example was an interview with, with Steve Jobs just before he died. It was 2010, 2011. He just released the iPad. And um, the product had been on the market for about three months. It was selling very well. And the journalist said to him, so your kids must love the iPad. And Jobs said, we don't let them use it. We don't let them have the iPad at home which is surprising because he'd been up on stage publicly saying, this is a great device. You should have it. Your kids should have it. It's great for education. It's great for entertainment. And then he was very candid about not letting his kids use the device, which is it's bizarre. It's, it's like a drug dealer saying my kids shouldn't take these drugs, but the rest of the population should. I was envisioning if you and I worked, uh, God forbid, for Philip Morris and we were pushing cigarettes, but uh, nobody in our house smoked, right? Exactly. It's the same idea. And it's so inconsistent with how business usually works. Did he say why, though? Or did he just say, we don't do it at home? We're going to jump right back to that interview in just a minute. But I want to talk to you about Athletic Brewing. They're the sponsor of today's episode. We met their founder, Bill Schufelt, at a Spartan race. He was a super authentic guy, and he told us why he started Athletic Brewing. He started it for people who love craft beers but don't want the alcohol. He uses high-quality, all-natural, all-organic ingredients to create brews for everyone. They have a run-wild IPA an Upside Down Golden Ale, a Freeway Double Hop IPA, and they're all without alcohol, but they taste like the best craft beers. Beer's been used through the ages as a great replenishment option after exertion. Now you can enjoy an award-winning craft beer taste anytime without worrying about the alcohol. Keep a clear head, drink healthy when you want a beer with friends or family or to refuel after a race. You shouldn't have to sacrifice your ability to be healthy, active, and at your best to enjoy a great beer. In fact, we at Spartan believe in them so much they're available as a finisher beer at U.S. races. Athletic Brewing is a company pioneering a revolution in craft, non-alcoholic beers. Place your order today at athleticbrewing.com. And don't forget, you get free shipping on two six-packs or more. Did he say why, though? Or did he just say, we don't do it at home? Um, yeah, I, so the article talks about jobs and a whole lot of other tech titans as well. And they basically say, we worry despite all the advantages our kids have, that they will be unable to spend the right amount of time on these devices. So they might spend more time than we'd like. Um, it's, it's almost like a gateway. Like once you're in there, it's really hard to stop. It's kind of binary. Like either you don't use these devices or you use them more than you would like. Yeah, plus if your dad runs Apple, you probably get like the coolest Apple stuff and then your kid has too much to like really cool beer. Maybe they That's were- probably true. It's probably true as well. <laughs> Whatever answer you need to justify the fact that our children have phones. There's, it's, <laughs> listen to books and stories and like, there's just so much fun that does come out of it and information. Oh, yeah. It is. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not here to suggest, um, and I've never suggested that we need to kind of roll back to the 50s and say we should have no devices and screens are terrible and they're the devil. I think we need to just try to extract the best parts of them while leaving the worst parts behind. Um, and, and especially during, during, a, pan a pandemic when you can't be physically close to other people. We use the term social distancing. That's the worst thing in the world. What we want to do is phys physically distance, but not socially. And screens allow us to get a little bit closer to other people. So I think there are huge benefits to having screens. Try to imagine this pandemic 20 years ago, if it had happened before we had, you know, Zoom, FaceTime and Skype and so on. I think it would have been a very different situation for a lot of us. It would have been a lot harder in some respects. I'm going to go call my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Nice to meet you. You too. Bye-bye. We have work to do on her. Um, so, so how would you do that? How would you, how would you get the, like, first of all, when you said you're not suggesting going back to the 1950s, I was, I want to go back to the 1800s. Um, I'm hoping we all do, but, but if that's not going to happen, how do we get the most out of technology and be quote unquote advanced without the negatives? What do we do? 
Well, I'm, there are a few. I buy one of these. They make these phones now that don't have any of the smart stuff in them. Yeah, that's fine. If you want to do that, that's fine. I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. I think you'll succeed fine. And um, it's hard, right? I, I've had people email me and say, you know, I, I don't use screens at all. I don't use technology, but it becomes the defining feature of their lives. It also makes me wonder why they're emailing me, but there are people in that position. And it, it's just hard to live in this world today, to travel, to communicate, to engage with all sorts of different organizations that are central to our lives without a screen of some sort. So the, you can't go cold turkey in the way you can with substance abuse. And that's, that's tough, I think. So the question is, how do we extract the best and leave the worst behind? Part of it is about establishing the right habits. So I know that one of the big problems for me is if I use, if I use this device before bed, it's gonna be hard for me to sleep. So what I try to do is to stop using it about an hour before bed. That's important for me. Also in the morning when I wake up, I try for the first half an hour or so not to check my emails. Because once I do that, the day's begun and it just ramps up from there. Um, other thing I do is at dinner time, I try my very best. We have a little box in the kitchen. Um, I have a three-year-old and a four-year-old, so they don't have phones yet. But I want to sit at the table with them, with my wife, and actually interact. And so we do our very best to remove the screens that we can, put them in that box. So these kinds of habits, like no matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing, I will not have dinner with a screen. That's an important habit and a rule. And if you can establish enough of those, you set boundaries that mean that you get the best from these devices at the times that make sense, and they don't encroach on your well-being in times when they really should be left behind. And as, an, as a runner, I, I don't run with screens. I have a, I'll have a watch that will track my pace and things like that, but I won't use it. I'll basically put either, I'll put a little um, cover over the top of it so I can't see it, or I'll put it on the setting where all I see is the time, so I know what time it is. Um, and those, those things are important for my well-being. The guard, guardrails, I like that. Yeah. Um, and just stick to them. You need to almost put it on an index card and laminate it and say, "Here's here are the rules of engagement. Kind of yeah. like, like, you know, a lot of times when I sit down at a table and you take your phone out and put it on, everybody puts their phones on the table, right? I envision, I always go back to the 1800s. We used to do that with guns, right? We had our gun, but there were rules of engagement with a gun, right? You didn't, you didn't point it at people. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that gets at the heart of the issue here, right? These pieces of tech are really new. We haven't had them around for long enough to have developed a kind of set of cultural norms about what works and what doesn't. We're still working it out. So whereas with something like guns, where they've been around for long enough for us to know there are there are ways to be safe with them, there are ways to be polite and so on, that doesn't exist yet for screens. And so there's no real digital hygiene. But what there needs to be in schools is a, is a sort of, you know, you have PE, you have a physical education class, you have a class about, obviously manners are taught constantly, you're learning math, you're learning English, you're learning languages. You also need to learn how to interact with this thing that takes up six hours of our day or four hours of our day. And so part of class and part of the curriculum should be here, are, you know, we're gonna spend the next six months teaching you when you're a six or seven year old, how to use your phone in a way that will be ideal for you and help you live a full life. And that doesn't happen yet in the way it needs to happen, I think. So, so um, what would you teach them? Like, I know you said a six month course where my mind was going was we have a farm in Vermont where Spartan was started. And I wondered, you're not gonna get people to come for six months. Like when you say six months, just turns a lot of people off, but you know, it's like seven minute abs. If you can get me a six pack in seven minutes, I'm interested. Seven months, not as interested. What could we do quickly? I think it's quick. I, I don't mean six months where you're dedicating six months of your life to it. I just mean like a semester and one of the classes you have during that semester is, is about digital engagement and how to engage. And some of the things you've raised, like this question of, this would be for older kids, I think, maybe teens, but that question of echo chambers and showing them that when you live in an echo chamber, your views are formed entirely on the basis of what you're learning within that echo chamber. You'll never be exposed to the other side's arguments or ideas. And it'll make you narrow-minded. It'll be very hard for you to understand where other people are coming from, which I think is one of the biggest problems with society today. So it doesn't have to be six months all the time. It can be half an hour once a week for six months, but I think it's worth doing. You ask about what we can do in a short space of time. Um, I think a lot of these interventions are incredibly simple, right? This idea of, of saying, here is my rule from today, I will not have a phone at the dinner table, no matter what, no matter where I am, if I'm at home, if I'm at a restaurant, if I'm alone, if I'm with my kids, if I'm with friends, doesn't matter, blanket rule, phone goes in a box or better yet, lock it in a cupboard in a different room. Put it as far away from you as possible. 
The other thing you could do is track how much time you're spending with your phone and whether you do meet that 24 hour requirement that Apple has for you. They want you to have that phone nearby all the time. I know that I try to spend as much of my day as possible with my phone far away so that I'd have to walk to get it because it's going to have a, a smaller effect on my experience of the world that way. So these are, these are really simple interventions. It just, it's a mindset switch. You just have to decide from now, whenever I'm not actively using my phone for something that's bringing me utility and benefit, I'm just going to keep it as far away as possible. You these, and these things don't take time. You and I, we're going to set some concrete rules that maybe we could push out around the world because I think, I think when it's, it's gray, when like, hey, you know, maybe you don't use it at the table or maybe you don't do this. I think we should just set some standards and we just, and we just start to teach the world. Um, if, if your book, does your book set exact standards? Irresistible? It's, it it sets some. It sets some. I mean, it's not a one size fits all thing. I think it's got to be a rule that makes sense for you. Honest, honestly, about the dinner table though, you go to a restaurant, you watch families where there are seven people at the table and they're all, they're all on their phones, right? There are seven phones and seven people. And that th there is no version of the world in which that doesn't look like some like dystop dystopian hellscape. The idea that it's okay for people to sit together and instead of interacting and enjoying each other's company, they're doing that. I don't think there are too many people that argue that that's okay. And I, I once I say it, I'm, I'm hesitant because I'm afraid to say it because that means I got to stick to it. But <laughs> um, one hour in the morning before you look at it, fair rule that that doesn't matter across cultures. I think so. Works right. for me. One hour, uh, can't touch your phone. You got to be awake, get moving, get a little exercise on before you even look at your phone. Um, go get a, a, an analog alarm clock, I guess. That's the problem is we use it as an alarm clock and then it's right in our hand. Yeah, that's the problem. That's the big problem with convergence in general. Everything happens on this phone. This is basically a Radio Shack store from the 90s in one tiny device. And that's the problem. So yes, find yourself a cheaper, simple $5 alarm clock. You just gave me another idea. What if you and I made a phone that looked like a kettlebell and was 35 pounds? <laughs> now, That's a good idea. Bring it as much as you want. <laughs> Can you imagine sitting at dinner? I'm talking to you, trying to hold up this 35 pound kettlebell. But anyway, so <laughs> one hour you're going to get some activity on before you look at your phone. You're never going to use it at the table for meals. Never going to have your phone for meals, yep. right? Good one. Um, shut it off at least one hour before bed or, or yep. stay at least one hour before bed. I think an hour is good. Some people say 90 minutes, but an hour, I think an hour is okay. So those are three simple ones. Any, any one I missed that you would add? Um, I think those are big ones. Those are some of the biggest ones. They have a huge impact on the way people live. Um, and especially the one about physical distance, like trying to aim to have four hours during the waking day. This sounds easy. It's really hard. Four hours of the waking day where you can't, where you're not in the same room as your phone. And you could time it as well. You know, just try to follow, track yourself over time. See if you can do that. Um, for most adults, that's a long way from where they are now. Most of them are at zero. So they spent all day with their phones. So that's, I think, an important thing to do too. I'm embarrassed to say it. I lived in Tokyo and I was leaving Tokyo three years ago, two years ago, and I left my phone in a taxi. And then I got on the flight and then for five days, it just was a calamity. I just couldn't get a phone because it was yeah. in Japan. I landed in another state where my office was. I just couldn't get a phone. I'm embarrassed to say, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking back. I mean, when did, when did smartphones become pop? Mid 2005-ish maybe? What, like 2000? Yeah, later. 2007 was the first generation of the iPhone. Yeah. 2007. So 13 years... In 13 years, I haven't had a phone by my side 24 seven, except for those five days. Yeah. And, and they were the best five days of the whole 13 years. It was awesome. Everyone says that. Everyone says that, that, that once you're liberated from the phone, you feel much better and happier and life is richer and you're noticing stuff you hadn't noticed before and your relationships are deeper and you're getting, you know, just every experience is a little bit richer because the phone isn't, isn't sort of in the way either metaphorically or actually in the way because it's physically there. So I, I think that's right. Yeah. Well, this was awesome. Um, I don't know. Give, I guess we gave people the, their three tips, right? Uh, don't touch your phone for the first hour. Don't have your phone around the table and then, and then put it away one hour before bed, get an analog, um, 
a device to wake you up. Hopefully it runs around the room so you jump out of bed. <laughs> um, if you go running, try not to take it. If you do take it, cover it. You said with a, you cover it with a black screen. Yeah, I mean, if you're an elite athlete, you need to track your pace constantly. That's one thing. But then again, screens can be great for utility. If you're using it and you're getting a lot of benefit, that's fine. But this kind of blind use of the phone for all sorts of different purposes that are not actually bringing us benefit is the problem. How do people find you? Um, you can find me online, um, adamalterauthor.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, which I don't use a huge amount, but I'm, I tweet occasionally about whatever's going on um, at Adam Lee Alter. Um, and if you search for my name, you'll find a homepage that's got all the new information. I'm working on a third book at the moment. So when, when that's available, uh, it'll be posted there as well. What's it about, if you don't mind telling us? Sure, it's about how to get unstuck. I think um, we, we view getting stuck as this kind of glitch in the system that you're not supposed to get stuck. But actually, if you trace every single success, whether it's business, personal, doesn't matter what context it is, there was a period where that person or that organization was absolutely fixed and stuck and unable to make progress. And it's universal. There are very few su success stories that don't have that moment. And so I'm trying to understand that as a, as a psychologist with a PhD in social psychology and cognitive psychology, trying to understand how do some people so successfully move past that and why do some of us get stuck and never really get beyond it? Um, and so it's a sort of roadmap for getting unstuck. I get, I, um, can I tell you an unstuck story quick? Please. Um, so I've been putting on races now. Sorry about the noise, but my second son is making a lot of noise. I'm doing a very important conversation right now. So <laughs> Um, I've been putting on races for 20 years, about 20, 18 years ago or so, uh, one of the events I was putting on much smaller than Spartan in its early days was taking place in the Hamptons, funny enough. And I was doing it for a friend of mine who's very, very uh, financially successful. And he, unbeknownst to me, had invited the US wrestling team. Uh, they looked very fit and the coach. And all the teams had made it through a bunch of my obstacles. Uh, but there was one team stuck, uh, not really physically stuck. I, I think it was a combination of physical and mentally stuck in about waist deep marsh on their way to pulling their kayak out to the bay. And all the other teams had gone through already. And so I went over there and I grabbed it and I pushed my way through the marsh and I was not nearly as physically fit as the, this is the US Olympic wrestling team. I didn't know that's who they were. Pushed out, got them in the boat and pushed them off. Three or four hours later, um, everybody was at the finish line and the coach came over to me again. I didn't know who he was and said, how'd you know how to do that? And I said, how'd I know how to do what? How'd you know how to just push through and get that done? I said, well, what, what else would you do? <laughs> and friends and he ended up sending me this u.s olympic wrestling team men and women to train on the farm in vermont where spartan was started to teach that mentality of pushing through when it seems like you're stuck and so it's awesome to know that you're talking about that because i i, I reference this story a lot and i think people in life there was no reason to be stuck but yeah. you could probably verbalize it better than me they just didn't know We've been taught for so many years to stay clean, stay out of the mud. What do you do when it feels a little uncomfortable and you're sandy in the marsh? You, you push through, that's what you do. Yeah. Does that make sense or? Yeah, totally, no, I agree. I mean, I think there are two, very broadly speaking, two ways you get stuck. You get stuck because there's some real impediment, right? There's a structural reason you cannot move forward. That's very rare. What's much more common, especially in, in business or in physical pursuits, is you're stuck, you're stuck because of something that's going on in your head. And a lot of it is that sense that I'm hitting a wall that feels unpleasant. I don't know what to do next. And a lot of it is small incremental steps forward, which is what you effectively imparted there. Totally agree. I, I would love to, um, if, if, if you would be, uh, I'd be honored if you'd be willing to give me one sentence in the new book, because we, our business, when we're not dealing with COVID, is to get people stuck. So that yeah. then unstuck. <laughs> Right. Well, if, if you don't mind, I might reach out and interview you because I think Spartan's story might be, might be an important one for the book. I would love it. And um, all right, you're awesome. People know how to get you. Um, I may smash a few devices today. You and I got some great business ideas. The five pound iPhone cell phone case. <laughs> <laughs> love it.
Yeah. It looks like a brick. An actual brick would be fun. That's All right. Not. We're out of here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate it. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Athletic Brewing Company, pioneering a revolution in craft, non-alcoholic beers. Place your order today at athleticbrewing.com and get free shipping on two six-packs or more. 